no idea whereabouts in the world you are, so I have no idea what time it is for you. But for those of us here on the East Coast, it is 1 p.m. Uh, for our presenters today from Chicago, it should be noon hour unless they've done something strange with the clock. Anyway, welcome to uh, this, our fourth week of Lunch and Learn sessions. Uh, we have a couple more really good sessions coming up later in this week. So if you've only signed up for this one, make sure to check the web pages and see what else there is available. In the meantime, it is my great pleasure to present to you the gentleman from CNX uh, on building an IBM web app in under 10 minutes. I don't know what they're going to spend the rest of the hour doing, but uh, I'm sure they'll find some way of doing it. Uh, one more quick uh, admin uh, requirement before we go on. If you have questions uh, for the presenters, please put them in the Q and A. That is the Q and A, because that way we can make sure that we get you a response, even if we're unable to get to you during the session. If you put them in the chat, that is much more difficult. So please put questions in the Q and A. And with that, I'm going to hand off to Richard. And since it's your slide already showing, my friend, you are free to go. Thank you very much, John. Uh, this is Richard. I'm just going to wave uh, for, for a second here before I turn off my camera. The other guy in the room here with me is Rob. I don't know if you want to wave, Rob, Hello. so everybody can see him. We are in our office in downtown Chicago right now, but and we're in the same room, but we are social distancing. Rob's about <laughs> six feet away from me to my right. All right, I'm going to turn the video off now so we can uh, focus on the presentation. All right, so this is me, and I'm just going to start out by uh, giving my email address. And so if you want to just take a picture of that or take a screenshot of it or write it down, if you see anything interesting you might want to follow up with me on after this presentation is over, I would be more than happy to receive emails and respond. That's no problem at all. I am CNX's co-founder and managing partner. And I'm going to start off with just some slides here to give you a background on our uh, valence modernization suite and also talk about the anatomy of a Nitro app. So the thing within valence or the tool within valence is called the Nitro app builder. That is a low code app builder that comes with valence and that, what, that is what Rob is going to uh, demonstrate uh, later on. And this is Rob and this is his email address and he is co-founder and senior partner of CNX. And he will take care of actually doing the demonstration. Once I'm done, I'll hand it off to Rob. Okay, so let's start with the basic question. What is Valence? Sometimes we refer to it as the Valence Modernization Suite. It is basically a suite of development and runtime software for all modern IDMI application needs. If you had to boil it down to one sentence, that's what it is. And it is native to the IBMI, so all the functionality is delivered via web services, and those services are written predominantly in RPG. So you see there on the right, that's some you know, pictures of, of what a Valence screen may look like. And Valence does require no external servers. So I, I put this in the presentations usually that I give because I get a lot of questions from people after they get Valence demos and they say, well, you know, where, is there a Windows server hiding somewhere or, you know, what is the special equipment you have to have? There is nothing really. You just install Valence to your IBM I. You have to be on 7.1 or higher. And then you navigate to a URL in your browser and you're in. So, you know, Valence is a suite of things. So I'm going to take just a few minutes here and talk about the, the main things, okay? This is not going to be a comprehensive list, but this is going to be like the top eight things that's included with Valence. The number one thing is the Valence portal. That's the thing that's going to handle login for your users, uh, session management, role-based security, like once the users log in, what do they have security access to do within there? That's all done within the portal. So there you have a screen of the desktop portal and, and the mobile portal as well. And the mobile portal is available on the Apple Store for iPhone and also on the Android or Google Play for Android. The next feature is the Valence RPG Toolkit. That's going to be everything that RPG needs to talk to the Valence front end. That comes in the form of a service program. You bind that into an RPG program, and then it gives that RPG program the power to communicate easily 
with the valence front end. Then there's the Nitro App Builder. I'm not going to talk about that one too much on this slide because that's the primary focus of the rest of the presentation, so we'll sort of come back to that one. Uh, Nitro Auto Code is a source generation uh, tool that will allow you to do things like simple inquiries or file maintenance apps by the developer would go through a wizard asking, and the wizard would ask a bunch of questions, and at the end it would generate an app, which could then be modified by the developer and enhanced later on if needed. Uh, Nitro iAdmin is a tool for IBM i administrators. That lets the administrator easily do things like look at QSIS Opera messages, answer message waits, um, reactivate users that may have disabled their profiles, look at school files, and all, all those things you know, that an administrator might commonly want to do. Then there's the Nitro File Editor, which I think we'll demonstrate that for a few seconds later on. But that's a really awesome file editor utility. Um, that also handles double bytes, so like if you have Japanese or Chinese and stuff like that, uh, the file editor you know, can handle any database file on your system to modify. Uh, then there's something called the source editor, which is really, the source editor has really evolved over the years. We mostly use it for IFS management now. Um, in the early days of Valence, we actually used to edit source code with it. We don't really do that anymore. So, in fact, in Valence 6, which is coming out later this year, we're renaming that to IFS Explorer. The IFS Explorer, yes. Uh -huh. um, and then there's Fusion 5250, which is a relative newcomer to Valence. This is a HTML5-based emulator, which we're also going to show that for a few seconds uh, when it gets to the demo time. Uh, this is a, an emulator that will work within the Valence portal uh, to where, you know, especially with a lot of users working from home now that weren't before, um, companies don't have to install client access or uh, access client solutions or another emulator on all those different PCs. As long as the user has an emulator, uh, or I'm sorry, a browser on their computer and they have access to the IBM I, they can use Fusion 5250 to access all those green, th green screen things on the, on the system as well. So those are sort of the main features. And I, I'm ending this slide by putting a star next to the Nitro App Builder because, you know, this is, this, this is really the star of the Valence modernization suite. Um, this is what actually drives most of the Valence sales. Um, you know, customers that get potential customers that get demos of Valence, you know, once they see how easy it is to actually develop apps with this tool, you know, that is sort of the main driver. All the other things are very important too. Uh, sometimes I, I jokingly refer to, uh, you know, if Valence was a movie, the Nitro App Builder would be sort of the star of the show, but you have your supporting cast as well. All, all of those are all important. And so the, the Nitro App Builder, uh, the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what is that? It's a low-code app builder, okay? So you use it to create user interface elements like charts and lists and all these things here. We call those widgets, all with no programming required. Okay, you can do programming to enhance those if you want, but it's not really required to do the do uh, basic and intermediate level things. So once you create these user interface elements, you can take those and you can uh, form multiples of those, one or more of those, into what we call a Nitro app. Okay, and then once you have those arranged, you can specify behaviors. And these are like user actions that define what will happen if the user does something, like maybe they click on a button or a row on a grid or something like that. And then once you're done creating this app using the Nitro App Builder, then you can use the Valence Portal to deploy those to your users. Okay? So this is what we're going to be going through. Um, so before, before I start talking any more about how we're going to build that app, I do like to talk a little bit about the theory of operation behind the Nitro App Builder. because if you're a developer listening to this right now who has only ever written manual code, you may say to yourself as we go through this demonstration, well, I don't want to use a tool like this. I want to have 100% and complete control over all the code, okay? And so I get that question a lot. Why would I want to use that as a developer? And these are the reasons, okay? Number one. It takes far too long to create and deploy useful modern web and mobile applications on your, for your IBM I users. If you're doing code 100% manually, okay, it's really taking you a long time. Okay? Yes, you have complete and full control if you write every line by hand. 
but really that takes a long time. And the businesses that we work for, whether you're an employee or if you're a contractor or whatever, they really need those applications that they've asked you to do in hours or days. The, at least in my experience, you know, when I first started out uh, in programming, oh gosh, you know, in the mid-1990s, uh, we had the luxury of having weeks or months usually to produce something, you know, if it was asked for. Those days are long gone. The people that we work for now, they demand, they demand things quickly. And if we don't provide it for them, they will get someone else to do it quickly for them, okay? And then uh, the next one is that truly modern user interfaces, and I have that word italicized there, truly, because sometimes we see things or, or other people pass off something that looks like, they say it's a modern user interface, but it really is not in our opinion. So I say truly modern user interfaces do require a high skill set, okay? And the, the skill set needed to code those user interfaces manually, that has a long learning curve, all right? And then the last one is that, you know, the good development resources that can do these kind of apps are very scarce. And if you do find somebody that can do them, they're expensive. And companies need to do more or produce more with less, less employees and less skill, okay? So those are all the reasons why we have something like the Nitro App Builder and why it is very popular, okay? All right, so now we're getting into more of the nuts and bolts of it now. So we're getting close to me handing it off to Rob for the actual creation of an app and demonstrate that. But before we do that, I got to talk about the anatomy of how a Nitro App is created because you'll understand it better once you're actually seeing it done. So the, the bottom part of it is a data source. We have to tell the Nitro App Builder where the data comes from. And I'm not talking about creating tables or anything like that. We assume that all your tables are created on your IBM I, your files, and you, you, know, you know how to create those and you have your data already. We're just telling the Nitro App Builder how we're accessing that data. Are we joining files to tables together? Are we filtering, et cetera? Once we have those data sources defined, we then can attach visual elements to those data sources and we call those widgets. So in this example here, we have a grid widget. A grid, grid is like a list of things, like a subfile, okay? And we can attach more than one visual element or widget to a data source. So in this example, we have a grid and a chart attached to the same data source, all right? Then you take one or more of those widgets and you create a, nat, a Nitro app out of that. So the simplest Nitro app just has one widget in it, but you can have as many widgets as you want. There's no limit to how many different visual elements you can have in an app. And by the way, you can also have multiple data sources with their own widgets all participating in the same app. Okay, there's no limit to that either. And also, really another powerful feature is that individual widgets can participate in more than one app. So you might have a map widget that maps out your customer locations or the locations of trucks. If you're a transportation company, you might have a map that's you know, tracking your trucks. So that widget may exist in many different applications. So you can have it so that if you update that widget in, in one spot, it can update all the apps that participates in. Okay, now let me rearrange this a little bit and we'll put the, the app level in the upper left-hand corner so that it's easier for me to talk about behaviors. So behaviors are sort of actions that are defined at the app level. And for example, a behavior might be if a bar on the chart widget is clicked, then maybe I'll update something on the grid widget. Maybe I'll limit the list in the grid then when the user clicks on the chart. Another one might be if a row on the grid widget is clicked, then maybe I'm showing an address for that row on the map widget, okay? And I'll do one more here. So. And then we might have an advanced one where if a button is pressed on the grid widget, maybe I'm calling a special process written in RPG to perform some special task. And there's a lot that you can do with that. There's a many, many different things. On, on a low level, you know, you can do everything without coding. So we, that's why we call it a low code app builder, but you can do coding to enhance these applications in many different areas if you want or need to. Okay. So that, that's basically the anatomy of an app, and I'll just sort of briefly go through some other things. We offer some training classes on this stuff. Um, these are classes, we have not been offering them recently because we haven't been able to sort of get together. Um, but we started uh, during the lockdown, 
we started this sort of free Valence Developer Diaries video series. This is held live on Fridays at 10 a.m. And the replays are all on YouTube. And I think once we transition it to Rob and he's showing and we have his browser up, we'll actually show you how to get to those videos um, and see them. We've been told that they've been very helpful. I think there's about nine hours of them out there right now. So it's like access sort of like a training. Okay. So at some point, maybe later this year, we'll, we'll be resuming training classes, but you know, the video series is available now. Uh, different ways to engage with CNX. This is sort of for your information, just to know that we have these different ways of engaging with CNX as you try Valence or if you become a customer. You know, we can help you in any way, all the way from you could do everything on your own if you want, all the way down to us doing sort of turnkey applications for you. All right. Uh, this is some notable customers that we have. You know, just so you know, this is actually used, uh, the things that you'll be seeing are used by large customers in many interesting ways. So that's some notable customers. Um, and now it is going to be demo time. Now before I, before I transition it to Rob to actually see how a, an application is created, I'm just going to reiterate again, you know, use the chat to ask actually, questions. Actually use the Q&A, not the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, use the Q&A, all right. It was chat last time, I apologize. So, so, so use the Q&A for questions. Get a question in there any way you can and we'll, we'll figure out where it is and, and answer it. Um, and before I transition to Rob, is there anything, any questions for me that came up on Q&A before we transition it to you, Rob? Uh, nothing I think that we need to answer uh, interactively. You can just uh, key them in. They're, they're pretty. Uh, okay. I mean, one of, one, of the, one of the questions we get all the time is, do you need VPN to access this app? And uh, You just need a way to get to your IBMI. So whether it's VPN or SSL. Well, that is an interesting one to answer right now. So. Yeah, to access the apps, you need some way to get to your IBMI. So if, if, you're, if your users already have VPN access, that's obviously the easiest way. But we do have plenty of customers that have the, uh, IBM, uh, the IBMI, the port on which Valence operates. By default, it operates on port 7052, but you can set that port to whatever you want. As long as your network administrator can make that port available to the outside and apply an SSL certificate for encryption to that, and you have, um, you know, the, there's also two-factor authentication, which you can activate um, to make it very, very secure. And if you have, if you want to, if anybody listening to this wants any more details about that uh, from a technical level about how secure it is, et cetera, um, you know, you can follow up with me via email later. And I will say we do have plenty of customers doing that, and it's been fine. All right, so now... Uh, Rob, I'm going to maybe just talk you through a few things. Before, before you do the, um, the app demo, I'm going to ask you to just, what you're seeing right now is Rob's screen, and uh, he's on the login screen for Valence, obviously. But I wanted to point out that you can choose your language. Right now we're looking at English. So if your company has multilingual needs, um, the whole Valence portal is translated to nine different languages. So like switch to Japanese, for example. And the whole portal now you'll see is in Japanese, including error messages and everything. And this is a professional translation. It's not, it's not a Google Translate. It's professionally translated. Um, and so when you're developing your apps, you can utilize the multilingual tools that is built in within Valence to do that yourself, if necessary, within your own application. Yeah, this was actually one of the questions that came up was uh, Unicode support. Oh, yeah, 100% full Unicode support. We, we actually have quite a lot of Valence customers in Japan. Uh, you know, we're very proud of that because uh, that, you know, if, if it works in Japan, it pretty much works anywhere. Um, okay, why don't you go ahead and log off and then back on in English so we can see what we're doing. Um, and then I'll just point out quickly, once Rob logs back in, if you could log into the portal administration. So if, if you would be the one responsible for administering apps in, within Valence and deploying them, you would use portal administration. And this is where there's a ton of settings within Valence. Obviously, we don't have time to go through them all, but there's many, many different options of how to set Valence up uh, with, with security and how to log in and all that. Um, and Rob, if you wouldn't mind maybe uh, flipping over to the users. Um, so this is all your users that are defined within Valence. This is just a test system, so we only have a handful. Um, here's where you would go to define what the user has access to. So you can assign groups, you can assign apps to groups, and then you assign groups to users. And then when that user logs in, they're only going to be able to launch those apps for which they're authorized either individually or within their group. 
So like for example, your users, end users generally would not have access to portal administration at all. That's an administrator's tool. So they're only going to have app, access to the apps that you give them authorization to. Okay. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, we don't need to cover anything more in there. there. There's a lot to that portal administration. It's very well documented, so you can look that up if, if you want. Um, I would like to probably just show a few of the examples of Nitro App Builder. If you go, the orange icons along the bottom there are all example apps that are included with Valence that are actually distributed with Valence to give you an idea of the kind of things you can do with the Nitro App Builder that Rob will be demonstrating. So just click one of them, Rob, customer dashboard. This is an example of a customer dashboard. You could call this up on the Nitro App Builder and just see how it's defined, see how we created it. Um, you know, very simple. Where are the customers? You know, what countries are they in? This is all test data, by the way. Uh, you can click on one of the pie charts and see a map. So Rob clicked on Germany, and now we're seeing, okay, there's the actual address locations all in, in Germany. It's just using the Google Map API. Um, pretty easy to set up. Okay, that's customer dashboard. Let's try another one. This is IBM iTables. This is an example of using the IBM SQL. Uh, service utilities. Okay. So if you're familiar with those, you can you can uh, imagine how you can just create an SQL statement to give you a list of you know informatics from your own IBM I system. Okay. Let's show let's show one more in the interest of time. Uh, just the warehouse dashboard. I kind of like this one. So this is a you know if you're managing a warehouse or whatever you have on-time performance of shipments uh, on the pie chart in the upper left. These are all the upcoming shipments in the list. Uh, you can click on one of them to get more information, so forth. So you can you can call up all these within the Nice Wrap Builder to see how they're defined and how the behaviors work and how they link uh, link back and forth. So you can sort of click all around here and test those. I think before I turn it 100% over to you, Rob, maybe one more thing with you know, the Fusion 5250. I kind of promised in my first slides we would show the Fusion 5250. This is the emulator that works right within the browser. So Rob just clicked on the icon. So now we're actually using an emulator right within the Valence portal. So nothing special had to be installed on the system or anything like that. It's a full-blown 5250 emulator. Um, this is a CNX design. It's not something that we, you know, bought from another firm or, you know, shoehorned some Java thing in here. This is something we coded entirely ourselves. Um, it is a totally HTML5 uh, emulator. And I mentioned also you can set up macros so you can actually have individual icons to go into specific programs. So, for instance, the legacy order in inquiry here will actually demonstrate this later with the low code tool. But at this point, I'm going to turn it totally over to you, Rob. Yeah. Okay. okay. I got it. Okay. So, um, yeah. So that that's a good overview. I just want to mention a few other things while I'm here. The utilities, uh, the file editor is very handy for developers and users alike, depending on you know their level of authority. But you can uh, just type any you know, any name of uh, a file on your system, and it'll pull it up. And you can browse the contents. You can rearrange the columns. You can change your sort sequence. You know, edit edit the contents. It's just really handy to have that as a developer to quickly look at you know, if you're if you're working on a program that's manipulating data and files, you can actually go and check the files real quick and set up filters and all sorts of things so you can pre-configure all how it all looks and everything. Previews. Um, another thing as an RPG developer, uh, which I imagine a lot of us on here are, if you're creating you know web service programs or things to respond to uh, the Valence portal, you can uh, use this test RPG call application to actually see you know, uh, the example of a, of a response coming from your RPG program. So I happen to know we have a program called EXGRID all, and if I do an action of uh, load, I think it's called load grid, yeah. if I call that, I'm going to actually make a call to an RPG program, and it's going to come back with a JSON. Here's the raw response, and here's the structured JSON response, and you know this is kind of the the backbone or the glue, if you will, of, uh, of uh, web apps uh, sending and receiving uh, JSON with uh, the back end. So when you get your hands dirty into development with RPG and JSON, uh, this is a good way to just kind of test that it's working the way you expect when, before you wire it up to an app. But what we're actually going to cover today doesn't involve any coding. Uh, the idea is that we're going to whip out a code, uh, whip out an app in 10 minutes. 
I'm actually going to whip out an app in under 10 minutes, and then we'll just keep embellishing it with the time we have left in this uh, session. So with no further ado, I'm going to go into the Nitro App Builder app. And it's going to bring up, basically, this is kind of the design uh, designer for your, for your low-code apps or no-code apps. Um, I'm going to exclude this test tag so we have a kind of a blank slate. So this is, if you download Valence and you log into your system, this is what you'd see, kind of a blank slate. Now, all those example apps you saw that, was, that we were going through, you can actually see those by clicking that cogwheel and actually looking at, can we get rid of that exclusion? We can see, you could actually go in there and see how all those were done. So if you're curious to see you know, how these examples were built, you can actually go into the App Builder and actually see those uh, in action. But I'll take those off for now. And then we'll get rid of the test. So let's just start by, we're going to create a really quick app just to give customer or give uh, your users an ability to list your customers. So we're going to use some example uh, um, files that are included or tables that are included in Valence, uh, the demo CMAS that I just showed you in the file editor. So I'm gonna, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm looking at data sources and widgets right now. Here's apps. I'm going to say, just show me the data sources and widgets. I'm going to go add a new data source. And it's, by default, it's going to walk me through a wizard to create a, a view, if you will, of, of one of your uh, IBMI tables or multiple IBMI tables joined together. So I'm going to say, let's just look at demo CMAST. I'm going to add that to my list, and then I can I can add more files. Um, I'm just going to just do a single file right now, so I'll go next. And this breadcrumb thing across the top, you can see it skipped me from number one to number three because I don't have any files to join. And now it's interrogated that file and given me a list of all the fields I can bring in. So I can click on the individual fields, or I can just click Add All, and that'll bring them all in there. If I wanted to, I could add a calculated field that might be a, you know, an aggregate or, a, or a, you know, a concatenated field or what have you. Uh, I'll just leave it simple for now. We could also do functions over certain uh, columns if you needed to. Uh, click Next. If I wanted to filter it down, I could say just show me you know, cu customer numbers that are uh, you know, greater than one, for example. Uh, no, real, no, no real need for that, so I'm going to take that off. So I'll skip the filters. I'm going to go to Next. Uh, there's no grouping going on with this. I'm just going to say let's order it by customer number. And then finally, it's going to give me a preview of that data. So again, we're seeing the JSON response. Here's a grid uh, equivalent to that. If the data looks good, if it's pretty much what you were expecting, then you can save it. So we'll just call this uh, Demo CMAST. I'm going to give it a tag of uh, Summit just to keep uh, track of what we're working on here. So now I've created a data source, which just gives me a list of customers. And so the next step is let's map that to something the users can visualize. So I'm going to create a widget over that. Now when you're creating widgets, there's a, you can do charts, you can do you know, graphs and grids. Grids are very common. It's like a subfile uh, on steroids. <laughs> so I'm going to create a grid over that data source. And again, it's asking me for all the columns. I can, I can pick the ones I want. So I'll just pick, a, pick the ones I think that are going to be useful here. And once I do that, it's going to start showing me a kind of a canvas of what, what it looks like. So I can see down below here, here's the, grid, here's the columns I've selected. I can see I've got some column headings that are truncating and things like that. So this is where you get an opportunity to clean that up. So I'll just change this to cust number. Call it that one looks good. We'll say this is just address. Call this city, state, country, and year to date sales, and we'll just say last activity. So you can see now we've got a little bit more user friendly columns. You don't see any truncation. We can change the column widths. Now column widths are relative to each other. So example for example here it says the state is one and the address and name are four. So that means these are four times as wide as a state, and these are being set by default. And relative widths are good in the web world because if someone's on a smaller screen, you can see these widths are all adjusting proportionally based on, based on these settings. So uh, that's kind of handy that to not specify specific pixels. But you can do that. For instance, I know the state will never be more than 50 pixels. Anything greater than 10 indicates pixels. So that'll come that'll constrain my state to a specific size. So now, no matter what the screen size is, that state stays the same. 
So those are some of the tricks you can do. Uh, we can also do some formatting. So let's say we want to center align the state. We'll put the sales in the format of some money. And we'll format our date in uh, the format that most Americans are familiar with. And I think that's good for now. So now we've got a grid built over our data source. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'll call this the demo CMAS grid. I'll put it on the summit tag as well. This is just to help. Once you create a whole bunch of data sources and widgets, it gets uh, kind of messy if you don't have tags. Are you going to, uh, Robert? You, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you going to be creating more data sources? Uh, yes, I'm going to create. I'm going to create an SQL data source. Uh, I'm, that's probably a good question. Somebody, somebody sort of missed it how you got here, so I, I just want to say in the, in the uh, Q&A that you're going to be creating more data sources coming up. Yeah, okay. I'm going to do, after our initial hit of this app, I'm going to come back and embellish it with another data source that's built through SQL, which is actually my preferred way to do it. So, all right, so now we've got a data source and a grid. I'm going to go uh, to the apps now, and I'm going to say, um, let's exclude this tag here. We're going to create a new app, and now we can bring in Let's see what we did for the summit. We can bring in our, the one grid I just created. So I'm going to bring that in. And now we've got a list of customers. I'll just call it the you know, customers. And I'll just leave it at that for now. Um, there's a few more things I can do on the grid, but I'm, I'm just going to leave that for now just to show that we just really quickly created an application. I'm going to throw it up in, uh, I'll put it in the example section. A lot of different things you can do for authorization to who could launch that app and so forth, but we'll just keep it available to everybody for now. So now if I go back to the launch pad, I'll see in the examples there's this customers app. So if I launch that, I can see now that I've got a paging app that's uh, we got set to 25 pages or 25 rows per page, and I can click through that. So now I can deploy that as is to, 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 to users. I could give them access to the portal, and, or I could give them a specific URL just to launch this specific app. Lots of different ways to, to make it available to them. But as a, as a list of customers, there's, uh, you know, that's handy, but it'd be nice to be able to do some other things with it. So let's go back. Now, we've already created an app. Now we're going to start you know, adding on to it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this and go back to the app. Let's go call up this grid and give the users a few more, uh, few more f uh, features they can do. Let's go to the configure, and let's say, you know, users love Excel spreadsheets, so we'll give them the ability to download that to Excel, we'll call it customers, and give them the, the ability to download the PDF as well as they want. Um, let's give it, uh, let's ch they change the paging to 100 records per page. Um, we could turn paging off too, since we know there's only, you know, 200 some records in here. Um, but just for the sake of example, we'll give that. You'll notice now there's a download icon and a PDF icon for the two features I just activated. Um, let's also give them the filter. So let's just say they wanted to filter uh, by uh, by customer name. So we can say uh, we can say contains. So they can filter by any name containing any text. And we could also do uh, you know, filters on other columns. And we can turn them into drop downs and stuff, but I'll just leave this simple for now for the sake of time. I'm going to save that grid change. So now if I go launch the app, I'll notice a few new features have shown up. Now I can search by customer name. So I could say anything that's got oops, American in it. So now I'm getting two American Airlines customers. Um, I also see that I can download this to, to a PDF. To, to just the current page. Uh, yes. Someone's asking about sorting. Did you set it so that you can sort any column? Yeah, by default I can sort by any column. So I can mm -hmm. say if I wanted to sort by uh, by country, I can actually put the country. Oh, I didn't. I didn't say I can move it though. But yeah, I got it set to go by country. And there you can have multi-column sorts. So this is a single column sort. So as soon as I click on one of these columns. I'm just sorting exclusively by that column. But let's say you had a secondary sort you wanted to have. You can do that as well. So if I go back into the grid, we'll go to the, uh, first of all, all these columns are listed as, as sortable. So if we want to say multi, we can say let them, we can also give the users the ability to resize columns, move them around, you know, hide them if they want. 
uh, and multi-column sort's a, a nice one if you have a situation where you need to sort by multiple columns. So if I save that and relaunch it, now the nice thing about these is you're just turning features on and off. I'm not having to do any coding for that. So now I can see that I can, uh, I made it so I could drag columns around. So I could put the country first and then the city. And then I can make that my sort. Right now I'm sorting by customer number because that's how I set up the data source. So if I click on additional columns now, I'm actually adding to the sort. So I want to make that, if I make the customer number the tertiary sort, I can see now I'm sorting by country, city, customer number. And then I can download that to Excel and go do something with it if I wanted to. So now I've given my users the ability to go get a list of customers and download it and go, uh, go to town with it in, uh, in Excel or wherever they want to. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back to our app and, and do something different. Let's say, actually, I'll wants the app again. Let's say I want to give, give, you, give another feature to the users and say, let's say I want to drill into one of these customers and see their orders. So I'm going to create another data source. Uh, this time I'm going to use SQL to do it. So instead of hitting plus, I'm going to hit this little keyboard icon here, and I'm going to create a free format SQL statement to get my next uh, grid created. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say select everything from, and the, the order, the sample order file is called demo or, there's a header and a detail. So there's a demo or H, I'll give that an alias. And I'm going to do a left join on the detail, the line items. So demo ord D as D for detail. And now we need to join them. And now notice as I type this, it's actually showing me all my columns for both those files. So it can, it can be helpful if you want to know what, what's the name of the order number that I join on. So I can see it right here. So I can say on, and I can actually hit F4 here if I wanted to, and I can pull the fields. I can say on the order number equals, and I just I can type it to order, you know. And I'll we'll say, let's do an order by. So order by, we'll sort by the order number. Oops, order, no. And then by the line number. Okay. So now if I go to preview or if I hit next, I can actually see that I just created a data source using an SQL statement that's giving me that same kind of response that I got on the, on the customer master. Now if I go back to the, here, you can see it's formatted it for me. It's broken it all out. And now if I wanted to, I could say, okay, well, there's no need to have the order number twice, so let's, uh, let's take out the, the detail one. So you can, you can uh, refine it as you need. And you can do all sorts of complicated SQLs. You can have with, take, with clauses. You can have subqueries, uh, pretty much anything you can dream of that you'd run in SQL. Uh, so you can actually spend your time just kind of creating the perfect SQL statement and save yourself a lot of, a lot of trouble uh, and then just paste it in here. Okay, so with that, I'm going to save this. I'm going to call this the demo orders. So let's create a grid over this. So I'm going to say create a widget. I'm going to do a grid. I should point out there's another, I'm not going to demonstrate that today, but you can also do an edit grid, which would be a grid through which users can edit data. So you can turn on, you can make them, you maybe that you want to give them the ability to fix a typo in the customer name. So you could say just the customer name can be edited by users. Um, so it's a quick way to give them access to, to tweak things, you know, based on their authority. You can also, there's also security settings. You can say some users can and some users can't. I'm not going to get that deep in the weeds here, though, in just a short session. So we'll, we'll stick with this. So now I'm creating a grid. I got a lot of columns to pick from. There's a temptation to include everything, but you want to try to keep it down to a reasonable uh, number of uh, fields. So I'm going to put the order and the status. I'll put the, the scheduled ship date, the line number, the item, the quantity, the price, and that's good. So now I've got, I've got you can see down here at the bottom, I've got my, my grid being built. I, mean, I think it would make sense to have the line number adjacent to the order number, so I'm going to drag it up here. And I might say, okay, I know the line number is never going to be more than two or three digits, so I can make that 50 pixels and say line, order, maybe number, status. You know, you can kind of see some things that might might get kind of long. This is this is a pretty long one. If I if I'm going to squeeze this into a small 
grid, that might get kind of long. So what I can do is you can use HTML formatting. So I could just say, let's make this a two line. So I'll put a BR in the middle. And now you'll see down here the scheduled shift date is now a two line heading. So you can do all sorts of tricks like that. Um, price per unit would probably make sense to put that in, in money format. And the scheduled ship date, we can put it into a format that the uh, users would prefer. Okay, that's good for now. Um, I won't put any filters or anything on this, we'll just leave it at it. Oh, maybe it'll, you know, everyone wants to download to Excel, so we'll give them that option too. Okay, so now that we've got that, we can go wire it up to our app and see how it all looks. So back into our customers app now, I'm gonna bring in that grid I just created, which is another widget. And if you wanna do the, the, the test orders, oops, let's make sure I get the right one. Mixing up, there it is. So is that the one I just created? I think I might have misnamed it. Let's just take a look. Yeah, that is it. Okay, so if I want to add it as a pop-up, so I'm going to say, okay, add this as a pop-up. Now that I've got that, I can actually wire it up within my behavior. So I'm going to click this button, and I'm going to say, I'm going to give the users an option to click on a row and bring up that list of orders. So I'm going to say, in my behaviors, I'm going to go to my, my grid. I'm going, to, I'm going to add a, I'm actually going to add a, a row menu because I'm going to do several things. I'm going to say list orders. And when they click on that list orders button, what the action I want them to do is I want to I want to filter another widget. I'm going to filter this other widget on my app to, that's misnamed demo scene grid. And I'm going to link it by customer number. So customer number to customer number. And I can put a little title in there, say orders for customer name and we'll save that and now you'll notice we got a little a little icon there that we can let the users click on so let's go see how that looks when we go in there so it's saved so I'm going to go back to my launch pad launch this app and I'll see now that I've, ooh, I've rearranged everything I need to fix that but anyway I got my orders here and I can see them are listed. I probably would turn off the paging grid. I made it kind of small. I can probably expand the default size and move these are out of the way. I just remember my previous uh, arrangement. Um, so now I can see the orders for any one of these customers. No, custom, no orders for that guy. Okay. So. I want to do one more thing real quick, uh, two more things actually. Let's, let's create a map widget so we can actually see a location for these customers. So I'll close that, go back in here. I'm going to create a new data source over my, um, my demo CMAST. I'm going to create a widget called, or I'm going to create a map widget. So this is a unique way to just say, show me where the guy's located. So just all you got to do for a map widget is tell it how to derive the address from your customer master or your order file, wherever it's coming from. And it'll go out and find that and throw it on a map for you. And there's all sorts of other configurations we can do for that. But in the interest of time, I'll just leave it like this. So I'm going to save that. This time I'll remember to set the name properly. And now we can go bring that into our app. So I'm going to go call up the customers app again. We're going to add the map widget. I'm also going to make sure I don't mix up my widgets. So I'm going to add it as a pop-up also. And then in the my behaviors, I'm going to add another option on this, uh, on this uh, grid to say, okay, let's add another menu that says show location. So when they click the show location button, we already got our list orders button configured, and that's going to go and show the, that other grid. When I click the show location, I'm going to say, okay, I want to filter the map widget. And again, it's just linking it by customer to customer. And I can say location of customer. Okay. 
So now when we go into our little app, we're going to see that we have another menu option. So if I go click on CNX, let me put the customer name back, back as the first column or second column. So I say show location, it brings up a little pop-up of our location. Okay, one last thing I want to squeeze in before we do uh, do too much more is, uh, with the Q&A is I want to show you a way to tie this into your legacy applications. So one thing that comes up a lot is uh, with our customers is they're, they're maybe mostly a green screen shop and they have customers that are very used to their green screen and so throwing them into something like this can be a little bit of a shock to the system. Um, so there's a way, a way to ease them into it would be to let them still get into their old green screens while still also leveraging some of the new features. So let's say they, they, the customers have this legacy order inquiry, that, and I just kind of whipped this up as a demonstration. They just love this thing. There's no, no weaning them from it. So, okay, well, let's give them a way to get to this from within our app. So let's just say if we, if we were in our app, if they, could, if they could click on one of these customers and get right into their legacy order inquiry, that would, be, that would just make them happy as clams. So I'm going to go in, back into App Builder, and I'm going to uh, wire up a a, a tie-in to that specific Fusion, uh, or I'm sorry, 5250 screen. So I'm going to go into my customer's app. And now I'm going to add, a, I'm going to add another menu option to here to go into that legacy. So I'm going to again come down here. We've got our, we've got our two options, list orders and still location. Let's do another one. We'll call it legacy order inquiry. So now that I've got this option, I'm going to say, okay, I want to actually launch another app. And I'm going to launch the Fusion 5250 app, which is a green screen, but I'm going to pass it some optional parameters. Now, prior to this uh, demonstration, we created a macro, which I won't get into, but that's, we're actually going to do a developer diary session on this. But I created a macro called Legacy Order Inquiry. So I'm going to call that, and I'm going to pass it, a parameter called Custno, and I'm going to pass it this value that, we, that the app already knows. So it can pass that into the macro and plug it into the appropriate spot in your 5250 program. So now that that's done, if I go and launch the app, I'll see now I have a third option where I can legacy order list. And that'll actually throw me into Fusion and give me the same thing that the customer was, or the user was used to working with before you threw them into the web world. And so they can still do all their, their usual things, and when they exit this, when I hit F3, it just brings me right back to where I was. So it's a nice way to kind of tie in the old and the new together and give people kind of a stepping stone from, from one mode to another. Uh, let me do one more quick thing. Well, I think I got just enough time to squeeze in one more thing. So I'm going to go add one more element to our little app. I'm going to create a, another SQL-based data source. I'm just going to say, wouldn't it be nice, nice to have a quick way to see who are our hot customers? So I'm going to do a select. I'm going to take Custno, customer name, and let's see, from demo. I forget the other name of the field. So I'm going to have a C mast. Learn to type wrong. Uh, and sales. So, Custno C name and CYTD sales from demo C mast. I'm going to say order by. Oops, spell that right. CYTD sales descending. So this is going to give me a list of customers, the, the biggest hitters first. So I'm going to see I got a list of all these customers that are selling the most. So I'm just going to create that and say hot customers. And I'm going to bring that, uh, let's see, let's go create a quick uh, widget over that. So this time, I'm, instead of creating a grid, I'm going to create a column chart. And the data field that we want to show is the sales. And the label is, we'll use the name because the customer number doesn't mean much. So now we're going to see, okay, we're, we're seeing some sales. Of course, we can't squeeze all that in. So I'm going to say, just limit me to the top 10. 
now I can see I can see most of those customers, but there some of them are a little long. Maybe I have another field in my customer master with an abbreviation. But what I'll do instead is I'm just going to go structure. I'm going to take the, the text and rotate it a little bit so it kind of comes at an angle, and then I can kind of see that that way. There's lots of different tricks you can do, but just for quick quick example purposes, I'll just leave it like this. So I'll say that is not customers. Some of now I'm going to uh, add that into the app real quick. So I'll just call this up. Let's do. Let's add a button. So we'll add a button to the top. We'll just call it uh, Hot Customers. We can give it a little a little icon to help uh, indicate what it is. And now I can go and add that, bring that into my app. So I'm actually not ready to, I haven't actually brought it in yet, so let me, let me do that first. Let's add another section. We'll just call it the hot customers section. Now we'll bring in that widget. So I'm going to bring it into this. So I basically I've created a new, another whole section for my app. It's separate from the original uh, part of my app, hot customers. There they are. And now I just need a way to get that to show. So what I'll do is go back into oops, go back into my behaviors. So put that button up there again. Since I didn't save it right for the first time. Okay, so when they click this button, what I want it to do is I want to I want to basically hide and show rigid. So I'm going to hide my main section. I'm going to show my hot customers and load the data. So I'll save that. Save it. Now we got our hot customers button showing up. So when I relaunch this app, now I'll see, in addition to all the features I already had with being able to you know, list orders, show location, legacy like order list, I've got this little button now that'll bring up my hot customers. And then I could further, you know, add to this. I could put, you know, if they click on this, then it brings up the details for that customer and so forth. But you get the idea. My point in all this was just to say, there's all sorts of ways you can create these apps with no coding required, and they don't have to just be reporting or inquiry apps. They can also be, you know, apps that call RPG programs that edit check data. You can write data. You can, you know, graph it, download it, all sorts of things. And the idea is to do as much as you can in the graph and the, in the visual part without having to do any coding. And then you can save your coding for business logic and things like that on the back end. So that was my quick overview. Uh, we've got about five, six minutes left. There's any uh, hot questions that came up there, Richard? Well, actually, there was, there was a lot of questions. You heard me uh, typing over here the whole time, so <laughs> hard to keep up with them sometimes. But uh, thank you for all the, the great questions. Uh, just picking some, I, I answered them all online, but I, I, you know, just picked out some that may everybody might want to hear more elaborate answers to. Um, the first one was about user profiles, so like logging into Valence in general. By default, when you install Valence on your system, any IBM I profile is going to be able to log on, okay? But there's plenty of settings to change that. So you can see Rob's calling up here. There's three different login methods. So login method one is IBMI. So the first thing when you type a user ID and password in that the system is going to look for is that an IBMI profile and, and is it the right password by using the IBMI API. Um, and then secondarily, if that if that is not a valid IBMI user and password, it'll check and see is it a valence specific password that an administrator might have set up specially within valence. So you can change that around and say, you know, I want it only to be IBM I profiles, or I don't want any IBM I profiles to be able to log into Valence. It's only Valence profiles that I set up myself as an administrator. Uh, maybe you want the user IDs to be like the user's email address or something longer. Like, so, and then you can also link it to an LDAP server. So there's many, many different ways to set that up. Um, so that's super, super flexible. Um, there was another question about the Fusion 5250, whether it supports the wide column support, and yes, absolutely. I don't know if you can call that up and just do like a uh, call to spool file or something like that, and it will go into 132 column wide mode. Um, so yeah, so it automatically will switch to the 132. 
another question was, uh, let's see, licensing. Well, we had a lot of questions about licensing, so I'll just quickly say that the license cost for an IBM I system serial number and partition is somewhere between $8,000 and $17,000, depending on what exactly you want to license. And uh, a lot of people ask, well, is there a difference between runtime and development? There's really not much of a distinction for that because you have to you have to be able to you have to have valence installed on every LPAR and system that you want to either develop or run the applications on. Okay, um, we do make special licensing considerations for high availability systems and so forth. So I'd really recommend that. Anybody who's interested in getting a specific price for your configuration, just email sales at cnxcorp.com and uh, let us know you want licensing prices. We'll ask you a few questions. You'll get a specific quote for your configuration. Um, and Rob, uh, some, uh, I think a couple people asked about how would you create a Nitro app on one system or LPAR and move it to another. So mm -hmm. do you want to talk about the export import for a second? Yeah, so it's the, there's a simple way to export any any component. It could be a data source, a widget, or an app with the data source and widgets included. I just go here and I say, oops, click the wrong button. I just click here and I say export. And that'll export the app into a save file, basically, and then you can import that save file um, on whatever other system or partition you have. So you can have a development side that you're developing on, and then you just export it and import it. Um, when I'm ready to import it, I can just come here and I can say import. And it shows me all the different things I can I can import. Okay, and then um, I guess we have time for a couple more. The Apache. Uh, somebody asked about like how how does the browser talk to the RPG? The, how does it talk through the server? And it's it talks through an Apache server instance. Um, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't initiate a job one job per session. So there's a, there's a whole series of jobs that are running onto the Apache server instance, and those work on a, a request response basis. So if Rob's doing something, an app might make several requests to three different jobs. Once the request is handled, then the job can service any user. So the jobs bounce around to servicing all the different users that you may have logged into Valence yeah, at that time. You can see all these ones that say CGI. These are all just sitting idle waiting for users to take actions on the front end. So, yes, exactly. If I, were, if I were really fast, I could uh, you know, do something and then see, I could see the CPU uh, jump up. Right. Some people have concerns or questions about like state, like uh, where the state is maintained on the front end, so the back end doesn't really need to maintain the state of where you are in the application. Um, this gets into a, another pending question about you know single page apps. Really, everything everything you've seen is is really uh, based on the single page app theory. So you, you once you log into the portal, everything that Rob is launching and running is all happening on that on that sort of single page, right? So you're not going from page to page to page in your browser. You're just sort of staying on one page, and that page keeps updating itself. So that way, the state is maintained on the front end. Um, Another question that I've seen come up is uh, the ability to t include images, uh, and that is that is an option. Actually, you can go into say our sample order entry app, and you can see that if you have images on your IFS, you can link those in real easily, just as basically paths to the uh, PD, to the JPEG or the PNG or what have you. And we've got a lot of resources on our website that uh, explain how to do that. Uh, okay, so. Last question. I think we'll take one more real quick. Um, it, the costs that I mentioned are that's a one-time licensing cost, okay? And then the that you, the first year of maintenance is included with that, and then additional years of maintenance beyond that is 20% of the license cost. So that that's sort of the licensing and then um, annual maintenance. So then, uh, if you want to run valence on your system. If you like what you saw and you want to try it on your system, just go to cnxcorp.com, click the Downloads button, and just click that top download link. It's very easy to install. You can be going in like 20 minutes. And then uh, can you jump out to the Valence Developer Diaries really quick? And if you want to see some of the videos we've done on training, if you just go to our calendar and click on one of the, the past developer series, you'll see uh, there's a link to re-watch the videos. We do this every Friday, so on the calendar you'll see them on Fridays. And if you just click in there, you'll be able to see all the all the history of the developer diary series. I think
think that is our time. So I guess, uh, John, are you going to come back on and close us out? I am indeed, Richard, and thank you both very much. There, there are days when I see a, a product in action when I really wish I had a business need to buy it. Um, I, I just love what you guys have done with this thing. Having seen it grow over the years, it is just mind blowing what you've achieved with this. So my congratulations and uh, thank you for doing a terrific job today. Uh, for those thank of you, you listening in, uh, we did have a couple of open questions in the Q&A still that the guys weren't able to get to. We will be getting those questions to them uh, in the next 24 hours or so. And uh, hopefully the, uh, the gents will be able to get back to you. Uh, for those of you who haven't signed up for the whole series, we have two more this week. We have uh, T.L. Ashford on Thursday uh, on uh, forms, design and pretty prettying up your forms. And uh, we have Mike Pavlak doing his own inimitable job on introducing Python tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, uh, have a great rest of the day. Stay safe, people. And with that, I'm going to be shutting down the shop. And just one last uh, thank you to Rob and Richard for sharing their wisdom and their product details with us. Great session, guys. Thank you very much.